edition of Turned Out of Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham. Once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or not still be involved with punk, but had life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, huge guest from the, the labels, many labels, uh, Step Forward Records, IRS Records, uh, Deptford Fun City Records, Illegal Records, Faulty Products Records. He also managed the police, and he's the author of the brand new book, Two Steps Forward, One Step Back, Miles Copeland the Third is on the show today. And this is a this is a fun one, but more on that in a second. But first, if you'd like to get in touch with me, head over to the email address turned at a punk podcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham. Thank you, Tristan, for all the hard work you do. And he will get the message to me. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at left for damien If you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is just by telling all your friends about it, letting everyone know that you know that we do this podcast a couple times a week each week and uh, talk about punk music with different people. You can also support the show by subscribing to it and rating it on iTunes. And thank you to everyone that does do that. Or by heading over to patreon.com slash turned at a punk and checking out some of the stuff we do over there. And a huge, huge thank you to all the people that do do that because it really does keep this show going. Thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for that. And speaking of thank you, thank you, thank yous, huge thank you to the fine folks at Vans who came aboard this podcast, God, like three years ago now, four years ago now, and said, Damien, we like what you do. We just don't like that you have to do it out of your own pocket. And they have supported this thing and helped me uh, keep this thing going. And thank you. Thank you to them for doing that. One day, one day I'll be back at the House of Vans parties doing live Turn Out of Punk podcasts. Oh, I can dare to dream. Dare to dream. Speaking of dreams, fucked up, my band that I play in will be going on a tour of uh, the Midwest, generally the Midwest, with the band Faith No More in outdoor venues. Uh, please uh, check out uh, the dates for those shows. They're on, uh, you know, just Google Faith No More Fucked Up and they'll come up. And then, theoretically, Fucked Up's also going to go on tour in January and into the new year. And I cannot wait to do that and see everyone again safely. It's going to be different. It's going to be weird. We'll get used to it. Also, Fucked Up is finally putting out Epics and Minutes on vinyl on the incredible Get Better Records. Check out Alex from Get Better's episode of Turn Out of Punk from, I forget which number that is. But anyway, uh, but anyway, very happy to be on that label. Very excited to have that record finally come out on vinyl so people can stop asking me about it. Also, we will be putting out Year of the Horse, the hour and a half long song on Tank Crimes Records. And finally, David Comes to Life is going to be reissued on Matador Records. You can find out more information about all that over at fuckedup.cc or on those respective labels, websites, and on to today's show. Today on the show, Miles Copeland is here. And uh, Miles has just written this great book, as I said off the top called Two Steps Forward, One Step Back. And it is uh, a fascinating read because Miles is a legend in the music industry, obviously, as the manager of the police uh, and as a guy who ran, you know, a lot of these labels. But really what he is is a legend that came out of punk and out of New Wave. And and most of the bands that he signed were, were out of this world as well. This book is peppered with stories that are you know, I'm sure fascinating for people like us. So when the opportunity came up to interview Miles about this book, I jumped at it. And this is a fun one. This, this is a really, uh, yeah, there's some really cool, interesting stories in this one. Uh, I recommend picking up this book. If you are a fan of the, you know, development of underground music in England and America, but also, I don't know why, but I was completely oblivious to Miles's father's history in the CIA and all that sort of stuff. So the first half of the book, reads like a Tom Clancy novel to me, and I was not expecting that. Maybe the first third of the book as well. So anyway, this is something that I strongly recommend picking up, as I say, and uh, I'm not going to yammer on anymore. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Miles Copeland on Turned Out a Punk. Miles, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, glad to do it. Anytime. Well, as I was just telling you off air, I am in the midst of reading your incredible book. Like I am really, I cannot believe how entertaining this book is. And I had, you know, I I had a bit of an idea of the scope of your influence and impact on punk music, which is kind of the focus of this show, but to kind of see it all laid out in one place, you really do see that you're kind of like this, 
behind the scenes architect of this sort of thing that would ultimately become alternative music and that whole explosion. But like really throughout, you know, the rise of college rock, you know, new wave before that post-punk before that, like all that stuff, your hands are always in there. So I'm, I'm very, very excited to have you on this show. Well, I, I never really thought much of about it when I was starting off doing it. And then all of a sudden I read in an English newspaper that I was the Svengali of the punk movement. And then I thought, <laughs> oh, my God, I'm a Svengali, you know, having just come from a kind of disaster the year earlier on a big festival tour I was I put together. And all of a sudden, you know, and basically be written off by everybody, just about like the punks were, you know, the the mainstream business pretty much wrote off the punks and they pretty much wrote off me because my big festival tour was a disaster and I had no more money. So all of a sudden I read that I'm a Svengali. So <laughs> I guess uh, I guess uh, I'll take it as uh, a, a tribute to uh, what eventually happened, you know. Well, even that big festival tour, though, when you look at it, like that's kind of like the archetype for the Lollapaloozas and the Warp Tours and the Soundwaves in Australia, like all these sort of big, large scale touring cultural festivals. Like you're really trying to experiment with that very early on, like pre-punk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, apparently I did a lot of things that turned out to be sort of uh, influential for the future because the Star Trekking tour was really the first major festival tour of, of the world, really. And uh, whether or not it was the influence to for Lollapalooza or whatever, I don't really know. But it, it was, I, I guess I can claim to have the first festival tour of, of the world, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of a nice kudo to be able to say I did. But but it was quite a disaster. And it sort of set the, set the stage for me to basically enter the punk world. Well, I guess speaking of entering the punk world, how did you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you ever came across the word or the genre itself? Well, you know, being in England at the time, you know, the press started jumping all over it. The, the mainstream press, the music press couldn't care less. You so you would pick up Melody Maker or New Musical Express or any of the music papers, and they pretty much wrote off punk as this sort of a weird kind of music that that was going to be a passing fad. And of course, in America, it was even worse. They just they they totally wrote it off as well. Let's not even bother talking about it, you know. But the national press, which is always looking for some kind of outrageous something to talk about, figured that you know the Sex Pistols were outrageous enough, and the punks were spitting on people and wearing spiky hair and you know earrings through their nose and various things that were sort of shocking enough to make to sell newspapers. So the newspapers sort of a drew attention to the punk music, which of course I then saw. And I realized one thing that I don't think many of my contemporaries did. I think they all looked at it as a musical form, as a kind of a genre. And the fact that a lot of the musicians, well, they called themselves musicians, some of them could hardly play. I mean, they, you know, it was like a band that somebody would say, hey, let's form a band. And they would say, well, we need a drummer and say, well, you be the drummer, you know, and the guy has never played drums before. All of a sudden, he's the drummer of the band, you know. So that was the kind of the way that the, the punk thing started, which was kind of exciting because it meant that you could kind of say, let's do it and just do it, you know. And that was pretty exciting to me because I had just been basically written off by everybody and the whole punk thing started happening. And I was thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, these people need help. And I know the business and I'll help, you know, and they, of course, responded because they needed they definitely needed help, you know, and nobody was paying attention to them. So the Sex Pistols and Generation X and all these different bands were having a hell of a time trying to get record deals and getting attention, you know. So I come along and and it kind of fits me perfectly because I was written off as well. So we were sort of two peas in a pod. They were written off by the mainstream because they didn't play music. At least that was the idea of the mainstream. And I was written off because I didn't have any money. <laughs> it really comes across though in the book. And also like you bring it up kind of here too, like how much 
innovation is kind of born out of that necessity you know even the fact that people weren't playing instruments like how much innovation came to music because drummers didn't necessarily know how to play in the traditional way you know like you keep referring to it almost as the old school versus the new school in the book and the sort of like in the old school it was like you know it was a discipline like you had to put in years and, and work and woodshed till you got good at your instrument before you went out there with punk it was about just getting out there and putting that energy to the forefront over virtuosity or any skill in some places. Yeah. In a way it was, they, they benefited by not knowing what they weren't supposed to know. You know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you go to college and you are trained to be whatever, you kind of follow that route. But if you don't go to college and you know, you, you're basically on your own and that was pretty much what the punks were since everybody had dismissed them. They pretty much said, well, you know, we're going to form a group and let's do it, you know? And then I formed a little, punk rock record labels and, and was said, well, I'll record your single. And they were all like, yeah, sure. Let's do it. You know? So it was, it was quite an exciting time because there was groups were popping up all over the place. Most of them could hardly play their instruments, but they all had something to say. And they were really a new generation that wanted to have their own heroes. They wanted to wear their own clothes. They did not want to copy their, their, their elder siblings. They didn't want to copy what their parents liked. They wanted to be on their own. And that was, to me, exciting. And that was, I think, led me to believe that this was a generational change, much more than a musical change. And my view was, well, you can't hold a generation down. They're going to have their heroes. And I, I allied myself with them and found myself working with, you know, the Sex Pistols, the Buzzcocks and all these different groups, you know, and Mark Perry from Sniffing Glue and the, the punk fanzines. But I mean... Sniffing Glue was a great example of sort of the punk ethic, which was, you know, Mark had, had hardly had any you know, schooling, you know, and he couldn't write very well, but he realized there was nobody writing about punk rock. So he just decided he would write, you know, and he created this fanzine and he stapled a bunch of paper together and he started selling these little fanzines, you know, and, you know, it was badly written and he used a felt tip pen to put their logo together and all that, but it was honest. Mm -hmm. It was straightforward. It was real. And people picked up on that. And that was really what was exciting about the bunk movement is that it was not something generated by the music business looking for the next big thing. It was generated by people who just had something to say and were going to say it come what may. Yeah. Well, and that authenticity is why it probably still rings true. Like this aesthetic is still showing up today. Like here's, you know, this guy making this fanzine. And, it, and it's, he's inventing a style of art. He's inventing a style of typography that people are still aping. Corporations, Nike, all these huge companies are trying to still get that authenticity attached to their products. And, and here it is kind of coming out of, once again, necessity. Yeah, well, I think really the, 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 the fact is that the, the ethic was, look, if you want to do it, do it. And that was really quite an exciting thing in, invention in a sense, you know, because most of the time, you know, you had most of the bands of the previous generation had had, you know, th they had gone through the ropes of learning how to play guitar and they'd gone, they'd learned the art of drumming. They'd, they'd gone to, you know, they didn't necessarily go to school, but they were people that studied music. You know, mm -hmm. even the Beatles were listening to you know, Chuck Berry and old rock and roll, and they would buy records and they would listen and listen, you know, whereas the punk rockers just said to hell with it. We're not listening to anything. We're just doing it, you know, and which is probably why, you know, a lot of the music, you know, they, they gravitated, for instance, to reggae music because reggae was another kind of music that was dismissed by everybody, you know, um, but that was really what the punk thing was all about. It was, look, if you want to do it, do it. And, and whether it be clothing, you know, and there were clothing designers, there were, you know, the, fa the fanzines, the, you know, the musicians. And eventually, you know, as time went on, you know, you started having the majors starting to pay attention. They knew something was happening. You know, the Sex Pistols get signed by EMI, get dropped, then get signed by A&M, get dropped, you know. Yeah. And, but they knew something was happening, but they didn't know how to quite put a finger on it.
Well, it's something. But I came uh, along and I showed them how to put a finger on it. <laughs> well, well, that's the interesting thing too, because like A and M drops the Sex Pistols, but then it's almost through you that they seem like they're trying to catch back up, and they they do wind up putting out a ton of bands uh, in kind of the punk new wave space. You know, a lot of it's through you and through IRS, but they are heavily involved in that world. Like it seems like almost like they're reacting to the mistake of losing the Sex Pistols or having to drop the Sex Pistols. Well, I think the, the thing about the Sex Pistols was that they were more of a uh, creation of Malcolm McLaren. You know, it was it was a press operation more than it was a real band trying to make music and trying to make it make a success. I think the band themselves wanted to be a successful band. Malcolm McLaren was much more interested in the press. You know, he wanted to prove that the band could could do gigs so that he could get more press. You know, mm -hmm. and I actually upset him when I when I did book some some gigs for the band. And I went up thinking I was going to be a hero. And I tell him, Malcolm, well, I've solved your problem. I booked some gigs for the sex pistols. And, you know, he kind of dismissed me and I go and change the dates and I go back up to his office, you know, and pretty soon he threw me out <laughs> screaming at me saying, don't you get it? I get more press and they can't do gigs than they can. So get out of my office, you know? So <laughs> that was my lesson and what he was all about. But the reality was that there were there were bands that really were trying to do something, you know, mm -hmm. um, and had something definitely had something to say. The Clash were one of them. The, the, the Buzzcocks, you know, Mark Perry certainly had things to say and Sniffing Glue, you know. So there were a lot of genuine bands that were had something definitely to say. that weren't just as inspired by, you know, pick up a guitar and say you're a rock band. They actually had something to say, you know, and those are the ones that I tended to gravitate towards. There's like a dozen mini books that could be written out of your book. Like, and one that I found that I would love to read was just like a tour journal uh, of your time tour managing the Sex Pistols on that first tour to Holland. Because I could only imagine just sort of what that was like, because you're really, you know, like prior to that, maybe the Beatles, like this was kicking off a revolution, you know, and that's the first tour when it goes to Europe for the first time. Like that's really sort of the kickoff for the arrival of punk in Europe. And I just, I, I thought that could be a whole book unto itself. I'd love to read just that part. Well, you know what, I, often I get asked, you know, you know, what's the secret of success and, you know, and, and uh, you know, all this sort of stuff. And, and, you know, I've had so many musicians who will say something like, Man, it's all about the music, you know. It's about the music, you know. And I say, well, you know what? It isn't really all about the music. The music is important, but it's number two. Number one is getting attention. If people don't know you exist, then I don't care how good your music is, no one's ever going to hear it. Mm -hmm. And that I think was the 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 you know the what Malcolm McLaren was all about. His job if it was, if one wants to call it a job was to make the sex pistols known. And he certainly did that. And he did it by saying basically they couldn't do gigs, you know, and he hired a, you know, Sid Vicious who could hardly play an instrument and was completely crazy, you know? So he threw out the one musician in the band who could actually play, you know? So the reality was that he understood that the message is get attention. What he didn't really, and it's why I, I say in the book that I don't really consider Malcolm McLaren a manager, in that he was not working for the band in the sense the band wanted to go and play music and do gigs, and his interest was getting attention, you know. So I think music is important, of course, but it's number two. The first job, and that exists today, just like it did back then, and the way go all the way back to Frank Sinatra, you know, and and prior to that, if you don't, if you're not known. So the first job is to get known, whether it be through MTV or through Spotify or through TikTok or whatever, whatever the vehicle is, it, the, the job is to get known. Then it's about the music, you know. So my, my first, you know, what I saw out of the punks was that they were definitely getting attention. And that was job one. And I, I thought that was exciting. Then, I, then, of course, I focused on the music which eventually came through and I formed IRS records and, 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 and uh, you know, started releasing as many bands as I could. I guess a large part of that too, is the front person of a band and you work with kind of the most iconic punk front people ever, you know, Steve Bader's uh, Jello Biafra, 
Johnny Rotten right there, you know, like you, uh, Lux Interior, obviously, of course, too. Like you're really working with like the the Mount Rushmore of punk vocalists, Belinda Carlisle as well. I don't mean to eliminate her from this conversation as well. So like it is really kind of this front person that's almost like the ringmaster that's drawing like the Barker drawing them into the tent. You know, that's what that's always well, what I thought I, the philosophy is. I think that's probably true of, you know, every musical genre there's always some person in the front that's going to draw attention you know mm -hmm. and in the case of the police of course sting was you know he sang he was good looking he was the front man he wrote the songs and of course he got a lot of attention just like belinda carlisle did or susanna hops in the bangles or you know uh johnny rotten in the sex pistols you know joe strummer and you know so the person who's speaking the person who's in the front the person who is, is sort of leading the charge obviously is going to get get attention you know and you know a lot of the bands that i went for had a front person who was engaging and who drew attention of course you mentioned steve baders you know <laughs> he would walk on stage and no one would ever know what he was up to he i was i was convinced he was going to kill himself on stage one day you know mm -hmm. lux interior same thing this guy was relatively meek and mild off stage, but when you put him on stage and the guy was a monster, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, the wall, you know, Stan Ridgeway, wall of voodoo and all, you know, you go down the list. Um, Pete Shelley from, you know, who, who was quiet and very, very, very sort of mouse like on his own, put him on stage and he had a lot to say, you know? So what was really interesting about the, these bands was that they were the idea that they would, that they would project was was foremost in front and center with them, which was exciting. I didn't have to educate them as to look, job number one is to get attention. They got attention, you know, and then it was to try to help them make music that worked. Mm -hmm. Well, it feels like it's almost the antithesis of what you're coming out of before with the more progressive rock scene where it was about putting the music at the forefront. You know, obviously there's front people and there's charismatic musicians involved, but like it felt like it was sort of like a, a yin and a yang almost situation between the two genres. Yeah, I think the previous generation was much more about the musicianship. Um, you know, when, when people were, you know, when they wrote Eric Clapton as God on, on the wall in some London, you know, it was not Eric Clapton, the singer songwriter. It was Eric Clapton, the guitar player that they mm -hmm. were talking about, mm -hmm. you know? So you had guitar heroes, you know, Richie Blackmore from deep purple, you know, um, you know, all down the list, you had all these people that were, you know, well-known players, you know, the punks came along and they basically said, well, it's not about the playing. It's about what you have to say. You know, it's about your stance. It's about something else, you know? So out of the punk generation, you don't have this whole thing about, you know, who's the best bass player of the punk bands and who's the best drummer and who's the best this, you know? I mean, some people credit my brother Stuart as being a great drummer, you know, mm -hmm. but it was not something that you would see in the punk movement where, you know, people would be talking about somebody as a great drummer, where or a great bass player, or a great guitar player, or a great keyboard player. The earlier generations, that was very much a part of it, you know, whether you have, you know, Keith Emerson on keyboards or you have uh, Ainsley Dunbar on drums, you know, you, you knew these people as musicians. Mm -hmm. The punks were not about that at all. Yeah, it's almost like you have a looking down upon a virtuosity and you hear it from bands that were sort of older generation bands, like even pub rock bands that were trying to cross over to younger bands, trying to play sloppy, like trying to play worse than they could actually play just because you didn't want to come off as, you know, like part of this old school thing. Yeah, you know, I, I had the one experience where I was asked to help Susie and the Banshees do a show. And I got in one of my road managers who, had been, who I'd worked with previously with the Climax Blues Band. And uh, I said, look, his name was Chris Runciman. And I said, Chris, do me a favor. Can you go to this pub in East London and help this group called the Susie and the Banshees and help them set up and do their PA for them and all that sort of stuff? Can you just help them out? And he said, sure. And I said, I'll, you know, I'll pay him and all that. You know, So a couple of hours go by and he calls me up and he goes, Mo. How am I supposed to help this band? They can't play. <laughs> they can't play. You know, I guess I, I said, look, don't worry about it. Just plug them in. Show them. <laughs> just do it. 
you know. But it, it was quite a shock to a lot of these older players. You know, they they yeah. they simply couldn't get their head around the fact that these guys were walking on stage and and doing it where they they knew nothing. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. when I first saw the Clash, you know, I was very impressed with the way they looked and the whole vibe of the place. But I don't know if they knew how to tune the guitars at that point. You know. <laughs> Later on, of course, they did. You know, yeah. a lot of these bands became pretty, pretty proficient players, you know. Mm -hmm. But in their early days, that was really not what it was about. Yeah, like, and actually, I want to talk about the early days because you mentioned starting a few labels. You start three of the most important punk labels, but they're all at the exact same time, right? Like Step Forward Records, Illegal Records, and Deptford Fun City all start in 1977. Well, they were all, an, the idea was the band is more important than the label. So Illegal Records was started for the police type of band. It started for the police. They were the first single. Mm -hmm. I then did Wayne County and the Electric Chairs. And I did, you know, various other band, Menace and various others on that label. They were more sort of raunchy rock kind of thing. You know, the Cramps were on Illegal Records, you know. Deptford Fun City, I started because Squeeze lived in near Deptford. And I wanted, I, they weren't really uh, grungy the same way as the, the cramps and the police. You know, they weren't punk punk. They were more of Beatles-esque. You know, they had real songs, you know, but they were very young. So they fit the punk mold. Um, but so I needed an identity for them. And so I, I thought, well, well, Deptford, by the way, is, is not a fun place. Believe me. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's like the grunge part of London, you know? So I yeah. thought Deptford fun city, I thought would be kind of a funny twist on, you know, a bit of humorous. So that became the, the home for squeeze and later alternative TV. Cause he, Mark Perry actually lived in Deptford and then step forward records was Mark Perry's, you know, I, I, I formed an alliance with Mark Perry. And said, look, you know, you choose the bands and let's let's and you can choose the name of the label. And he said, well, let's call it Step Forward Records because we're going to help these bands take a step forward. You know, mm -hmm. so he chose those bands. And uh, I so the label was really an extension of what kind of band was going to be on there and who was signing the bands, basically. Did you also put out the Wasps uh, Teenage Treat single too on Illegal Records? I, I put out the Wasps, the Pigs, and Gardez Darks, and some other records I'd rather forget about because <laughs> what, what was happening was that like any record you could put out, as long as it looked punky, they would sell. So I would I would you know record these different groups. You know like you know one day I got a, I book a I, I talk about this in the book. Um, I, I booked the studio and the, the group I had booked to record breaks up the night before, you know. So I get a phone call from the one of the members. He goes, oh, my old Mr. Copeland, uh, uh, sorry, me groups broke up. You know, <laughs> can't, we can't make this. And I thought, oh, damn, I already paid for the studio. You know, it was in those times where nobody trusted anybody. So you had to pay the 80 pounds for the studio or it wasn't going to be there. You know, yeah. so I had to fork out the 80 pounds, you know. So I, I had a studio paid for, but no band. So I go to the Roxy Club, which was the hangout for the punks, to find, see, I'm hoping that there's some band going to play there that I could record, you know. And sure enough, there's this group called Menace. And uh, they looked punky enough, and they sang three-chord punky songs. So I went in backstage and after the show, and I said, guys, uh, how'd you like to record a couple of singles? And they said, all right. When and I said, "How about tomorrow?" <laughs> <laughs> so we go in the studio, and I cut two singles uh, with with Menace, which were pretty good. And then Amazing. I'd go sell them. You know, I'd go and I'd press the records, and I'd get in. Get, I'd borrow my parents' car, and I'd drive around to the record stores and sell them. Well, that worked for like a couple of months, you know, because almost anything you could record would sell. Mm. And then one day, I go to a record store, and I've got the Pigs record. I forget. It. I think it was the Pigs. And the record store said, uh, well, let me hear it first. And by the way, do they have a following? And oops, you know, uh, all of a sudden they started questioning the records because the, the clientele would walk in and go, well, is this any good? You know, so, you know, I had to now start making sure I signed something that was actually, you know, had some kind of story behind it, you know, to, to make it sell, you know. So we all got kind of real as time went on, you know. But in the beginning, it's like, you know, anything works. 
Well, and also you mentioned the Menace singles, two of my favorite singles ever. Like, I think that band's incredible. And also, like, it, you know, you talked about how other people viewed punk as a genre. Here you are putting out stuff like Menace would kind of, you know, be much more in part line with the street punk stuff and like the, the oi stuff that would follow. You're also doing stuff that's much more kind of what would fall under a new wave. Like, I think that's why these labels are so interesting to me is because even the stuff that didn't sell like the pigs is, is fascinating. Like those singles are, you know, I think now I look back upon a lot more fondly than I'm sure at the time you looked at them. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I was sort of in the same punk ethic as, as, as the whole punk movement was, which is look, if I liked it and it's a little different, what the hell let's do it. Mm -hmm. You know? So, Mm -hmm. and you know, it, it doesn't cost a lot to make a single, you know, if it was 80 pounds, you know, and you'd go and press it, you know, so you'd be, you know, for, for, you know, 500 bucks, you could basically put out a single basically, you know, so it wasn't like you're making a movie and it's a million, you know, the cheapest movie is a, you know, a few million dollars or something, you know, this, this, you could pretty much do whatever you have dreamed up and do it, you know, and that was pretty much the philosophy that I did. You know, I launched a lot of these bands, Chelsea and these, you know, step forward records, the Cortinas, the models, all these different bands. And it was, you know, you could, you could get excited about something and be recording them the next day and be selling the record a week after that, you know, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's quite a big deal, you know, where, you know, you look at somebody like a Bruce Springsteen where he takes two years writing an album and then spends a year recording it. And then, you know, it's a year later when it comes out, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. well, wait, from the, from the first song he wrote to the, by the time the, the audience hears it, it's like three, three years have passed in the punk world. It was like a matter of weeks. It's much more in line with what, how the world and music works today, you know, where there is an immediacy to doing it. Like you, you do it, you put yeah, it the up. The immediacy was really whole, a part of the whole punk ethic. And I think the immediacy for me was exciting because you could actually see the fruits of your labor almost instantaneously, you mm-hmm. know, whereas, you know, in the previous generation, you know, I, with Wishbone Ash, my first group, you know, I was spending a year on the road, building them and building an audience and this and that. Then we, finally get a record deal and then you're you're spending a few years before that finally happens you know and it's it's a lengthy process you know whereas the punk thing it was it was lickety split you know you 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 put it out and three weeks later you're selling it you know well you mentioned the cortina's fascist dictator single which is i think one of the best punk records ever and you produced it i think right yeah i was in the studio with them um, it was another, you know, band that Mark, Mark Perry and I actually saw them together in the, in the Roxy club and they were just a bunch of young kids from Bristol, but they were, they had a real kind of style to them that was fun, you know, mm-hmm. and that they were, they were musical enough that actually CBS records signed them, you yeah. know? And of course, unfortunately I did, did not go spend as much time in the studio as I should have one of my mistakes, you know, and, and, uh, it's why I, I called the book two steps forward, one step back, because, you know, I don't care how smart I am or how smart anybody is, you're going to make mistakes. And that's part of the game, you know? And I think with, with the Cortinas, when they went it, when they finally got signed by major label, the major label sort of watered them down without me realizing it. And then when I finally got the record, I realized, you know, what happened to this punk group? You know, they were, They're now just like a, you know, middle-aged rock group, you know, and, uh, that was part of the danger of the punk movement is that you, you bring in old time producers and they want to, you know, they want to have a real guitar player, you know, and if somebody can't play, they'll get a substitute in, you know, which is really not what it was about. Yeah. Like it, it's funny though. Cause like later on in the book, when the go-go's of course do their first record, you know, and everyone freaks out, including yourself, about how poppy that band went. Like, in that case, it did work. Like, it's weird how, I guess, timing changes everything. And with the Go-Go's, that pop sort of shift it aided in their well, success. Well, it, it actually was, uh, I mean, I chose Richard Goddard as the producer. And the reason I chose him is because I knew he was a songwriter and he knew the dynamics of a song. And he had pro- produced the Blondie album which I was a fan of Mm -hmm. the first Blondie album, because I did Blondie's first tour of England, you know, and in a lot of ways, basically discovered Blondie, put her in the limelight, you know, Um, because she happened in England first before she happened in America, you know, but Richard Goddard had this sensibility to him. And when I got him to produce the Go-Go's, 
I was counting on that sensibility. But it's true that when he finished the record, both the Go-Go's and I were kind of shocked that I'd given him a punk group. And he slowed the songs down to the point where they were more pop than they were punk, basically. But the more I listened, the more I realized that he actually did, a, did us all a favor. He, he focused on the essence of the song. And, of course, that's why the record went to number one. And the Go-Go's also sort of came around to the view that, you know what, he actually listened to the songs more than they did. They were, they were maybe more caught up with the punk thing than, than he was. He wanted the songs to work, and he made them work. Mm. But they are still punky. I mean, the, the whole, you know, Go-Go's ethic was very much, you know, um, as, as one sees their documentary, which has been out lately, you know, I mean, <laughs> I think... <laughs> They didn't even know how to plug their instruments in. They didn't know that you, you know, Charlotte Caffey had to actually show the guitar player, uh, by the way, if you plug your guitar lead into the amplifier, you're going to get a better sound than if you just had this lead going nowhere, you know. So they were literally that, you know, unknown of the unknowing of the what the, it entails to be in a rock group, you know, mm -hmm. which was, again, the, the Go-Go's, was this five girls decided they're going to form a rock group, you know, and they did. Well, it's also, it's, it's, they're weirdly almost like a punk super group. Cause you, you have members of the eyes in that band. You have members of the tech stones and the violators in that band. You know, you have like, it's, it's like this sort of like complete amateur first time band meeting these other women that were coming out of these other groups. So it's like this weird amalgamation. And like you're saying, like it's one of the greatest debut albums ever made like you know well, i i think you know really it's part of the, the punk thing is is that if you kind of set your sights and say well let's just do it and everything's sort of in turmoil and you there are no rules really you're following you know there's no sort of standard so you know things do get mixed up and you know somebody starts playing and the personality clash or you bring somebody else in and you know off you go you know so there was it was the fact that there was really no rules no sort of standard to, to go by, uh, you know, the Go-Go's is a great example. I mean, they were dismissed simply because they were women. So if you were a woman in rock and roll at that time, very few people would pay attention to you. So, you know, the, the, they were rejected by every record company. My view was five women, what a great gimmick, you know, that, that could sell. They, they look, and of course, not only were they interesting as a gimmick, they also could play, you know, they, they had good songs. They had energy. They were committed. There was a genuine real reality about them, you know? So I picked up on the whole thing, but the fact that they were all women to me seemed like a selling factor, not something that was negative, but the rule of the music business was there had never been a girl group that had been successful. So let's not sign the go-go's, you know, I wasn't following rules. I was following what I liked. And I think that was really what the punks were doing as well. I think one of the great what ifs on this show would have been what if they had done that first record as a punk record? You know, obviously they probably would not have achieved in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year and things like that. But, you know, it's still fascinating to think about what kind of record would they have made if they had, you know, not gone that pop direction or not had that producer, like you would put them in there with someone else. Well, you know, choosing a producer is always you know, a, a question mark, you know, is mm -hmm. the producer going to do the right thing? Is the producer going to help the artist achieve what the artist is trying to achieve? You know, and I, I talk about a, a, an experience later on with Sting, you know, where I got him a producer. Well, he chose a producer who was a brilliant engineer who could put the sounds down uh, totally, but he was intimidated by Sting. And so if Sting decided he would you know, not have a chorus happen when it was supposed to happen, you know, the producer wouldn't say anything, you know. And I made the mistake of not going in the studio on the Soul Cages album early enough. And when I finally did go in and I listened to the songs, I realized that Sting had created a bunch of really great songs, but the hooks weren't there mm -hmm. where they should have been. And I said so. And, you know, Sting understood what I said, but he said, I'll pay the price and I'll make a change next time. So I went to the producer after Sting had left the room and I said, you know, what happened? And he said, well, you're right. You know, these songs, they're, they're, the hook is not happening where it's supposed to. And I said, you mean 
you know this? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, well, why didn't you say something? He said, well, I, I can't tell Sting how to write a song. <laughs> well, isn't that your job? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I, I think in the case of Richard Goddard, he did his job. He told the group what should happen. He told the group, you know, this is a better song if it slowed down a little bit. In the case of Hugh Padgham and Sting, he didn't tell him what he needed to hear. And that album was Sting's worst selling album. You know, mm. the next album, I made a point of going in and we changed producers. So he he got the direction and he once again started having the hooks where they should have had. And it was became one of it became actually his most successful album. Yeah, I guess, you know, as you talk about the difference between musos and anyone else in the music industry and, and eventually like these musos you know, become these sort of unique personalities where they develop these auras around them where people are intimidated by them. But like at the end of the day, everyone's just a real person, obviously. But like, you know, there's these sort of like, we put them on such pedestals at a certain level. Well, I I think that's, that's one of the dangers. I mean, I, I talk about an instance in the book where, you know, I, I was for a couple of years, I was sort of looked upon as the guy breaking the new wave in America. And I, I, I didn't really think that much about it. You know, I thought, well, it seems pretty obvious to me, you know, I mean, you know, the police were doing pretty well. The go, the go goes was doing pretty well. You know, IRS records was launched, you know, things are going reasonably well, you know, and I was then invited to be the keynote speaker at the new music seminar. And I go up and I make my speech and I'm, I'm sure I, hopefully I said something intelligent, you know, but I can't even remember what I said. But I walk, I, I, I'm speaking to about 2,000 people at the Hilton Hotel in New York. You know, it was the, the first time that the New Music Seminar had actually had a big audience and a big, uh, you know, uh, group of people showing up because I think people had started waking up to the fact that the punk rock thing was actually happening, you know. So I made my speech and I'm walking off the, and I, the side of the stage and, and some girl comes running up to me with a tape. And she looks in my eyes and hands me the tape and I take the tape and she faints in front of me, falls straight on the floor. And I'm thinking, you know, my first response was I never touched her. You know, I I didn't hit her, you know? And I realized at that moment that what must have happened is that she came running up to me as this person who, you know, this godlike figure who could change her life by waving a wand, you know, that I was this, Svengali with the magic touch, you know, and that if she gave me her tape that I might make her a star. And she was so overcome with this experience that she fainted in front of me. And uh, I then realized that I wasn't looked upon, not, I I wasn't just some record guy putting out records and, you know, sort of creating a little bit of a stir. I was actually looked upon by some people as this sort of magical person, you know? Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you realize oops, you know, I'm not just a human anymore. I'm somebody that can change people's life. You know, that's the, the vision, you know. And, you know, I, later on, I, I, I remember, you know, when I introduced the police in Shea Stadium, I walked out on stage and I think I was there for like a minute and a half, you know, saying, ladies and gentlemen, you know, welcome. The, you know, it's time for the police. And everybody goes crazy. The place just goes nuts. And it was the, the energy from the audience was so huge that I left the stage shaking and I was on stage a minute and a half. And then those three guys walk out on the stage, Sting, Stewart and Andy. And I realized they're going to be out there for two hours facing that same thing that I, after a minute and a half, I was shaking, you know, so something does happen, you know, when all of a sudden there's this perception that you're at the center of something, you're, you're a winner, you're a, and people want to bask in the glory, you know, and it's kind of disconcerting. I mean, it was certainly disconcerting to me for this girl to faint in front of me, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it, you know, must affect a lot of the rock stars when they walk out on stage and they're playing to vast audiences and they begin to think they can do no wrong. It, uh, and the people around them think they can do no wrong. And I think, you know, somebody has always said, well, people change when they get successful. And I think, well, you know what? It's actually people around them that change. Yeah, I think it's almost an acquired brain trauma in a certain way. Like you're describing it, like it's a physical reaction to seeing that kind of energy coming at you on stage. And that happens at a much smaller level, too. I think it happens in a room with even even 200 people reacting to what you're saying and stuff like that, where it eventually 
it can't help but change you, you know, like it's one of those things that, you know, it's like just sort of like a stimulus that you have to react to. And if you're not trying to counterbalance that in some way, it's going to change the way you look at the world. Yeah. And I think it changes a lot of people around you too. And so, mm. you know, which, which was always something like, I always tried to make a point of hiring people who would disagree with me, you know, because it's easy to hire people who will say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. But then, you know, you realize that you're not going to learn anything because you need somebody that's going to say, yeah, but what, so what about so-and-so, you know, and the artists that I always did best with were the ones that would, they would listen to whatever crazy idea I came up with, but they were savvy enough to every now and then dismiss one that they thought was a little too crazy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Sting, Sting was one of those who would always say, look, tell me the truth. And they were always predisposed to try an idea out. But every now and then he'd say, you know what, that one, eh, I don't know, that one doesn't work. And I would feel much safer with artists like that because I could then throw out nutty ideas and they would throw out the stupid ones, you know. And Jules Holland was another one, you know, where where he became, well, now he's probably the one of the biggest fingers in music in England, you know, with, with the big TV show and all that later with Jules Holland. But he was the guy that would, you know, you would throw out some crazy idea and he'd be predisposed to say yes. But every now and then he'd say, well, you know, maybe that, maybe not that one, you know, mm -hmm. and that was always safer for me. The artists that were worst for me were the ones that you would throw an idea out. They would go, oh, gee, uh, ooh, uh, what are my friends going to think? Oh, you know, uh, oh, gee, how could I make them? They're spending more time worrying about whether they're making a mistake or not, you know. Um, and pretty soon you, you, with artists like that, you go, well, what's the point of suggesting something? Because it's going to get rejected. So you don't, you don't really deal with artists like that. So I did best with the groups that would listen, but I didn't do well with groups that would do whatever I told them to do, you know? So uh, that was always the fear is that, you know, you'd come up with some crazy idea and the group would go, okay, let's do it. You know? And you go, Oh, well, wait a minute, but that, that was a stupid idea. You know, given that you're working with like, you know, such a wide range of personalities, would it change the way you approached uh, a group with an idea, like depending on who it was, like, would you approach, uh, sting in the same way you'd approach Lux interior, right? Because they seem like such different personalities from the outside. Well, I think you, you gauge whatever you're coming up with, with the, with the person you're dealing with, you know, I think, you know, I mean, sting was an intellectual, you know, you would make arguments with him, you know, that have to have an intellectual content with Lux. It was more of an animal instinct, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're different kinds of people. So you would obviously approach whatever idea you had, you know. Also, their their reaction to, to me was different, you know. I mean, Sting appreciated my intellect, you know. I was educated. He was educated, you know. Uh, we were on a par with each other, basically. Lux Interior didn't trust anybody, you know, yeah. especially some business guy like me. You know, he is. He assumed I had to be a crook because I was in business, you know, <laughs> because he'd been mistreated all his life, you know, and, you know, you, I, and I saw why, I mean, I remember I, I was on at some dumpy hotel and one of the cramps came to see me and the next night I'm thrown out of the hotel, you know, yeah. because one of the cramps had come to see me, you know, I remember going to a restaurant with, with the cramps and we were told to leave and I'm looking, wait a minute, this isn't some posh restaurant, you know. A hobo could walk in here and get served, but no, not the cramps. So I and the cramps were thrown out of a dump, you know? So I figured, well, they probably spent their life getting thrown out of a dump, you know? So why, why would somebody like me, you know, um, be somebody that would like them? I don't think Lux Interior could ever imagine I would like his music, but I did. I, I thought the cramps were great. You know, I was very proud to have them on IRS records. One of the most important bands ever. And and a band that, like you're saying, like it wasn't a gimmick. Like they're not putting this on stage before they go on stage. You know, like this this was something that they were these people off stage, it seems too. Like maybe not as crazy, maybe not, you know, attacking the audience kind of vibes or throwing up on stage kind of vibes, but like still they were definitely really truly freakish people. And and I mean that in a loving yeah. way. Yeah, they were they were subterranean. They were definitely subterranean, you know. But you put them on stage and Lux did become, you know, an, an animated figure. I mean, Ivy Rorschach, you know, I mean, she would just stand there mute, you know, playing her guitar. You know, it was a great kind of combination. But Lux would go out and 
drink beer out of his shoe and, <laughs> you know, stick the microphone down his throat and, you know, who knows, jump into the audience, you know, his pants would almost fall off. I mean, you know, the only other guy that was as crazy as he was on stage was Stiv Bader's, you know? Yeah. I think both of them were, aim were, were, were aiming to kill themselves on stage, you know? Well, it's like the two great front people, like two iconic, I guess Iggy would be the other one you put in that sort of like group of three, but like, you know, just people that took it to another level and that were by all accounts, very, just real. Like this wasn't performative. This was almost like an exorcism on some level. It seems. Yeah. And you know, it was, it was, I guess part of the, the, the beauty of it was you, you never really knew what was going to happen. And that was part of the fun of it, you know, because, you know, Stiv Bader's, you know, he, he would just do things. Unfortunately, they would shoot themselves in the foot sometimes, you know, and, uh, he would always joke that, you know, they were the opposite of the police, Yeah, you said the book. you know, <laughs> and it's amazing how when you, when you, when he does kind of lay it out in that quote that you have in the book, his argument makes complete sense, how they would be the complete opposite band to what the police were doing. And I guess, you know, it, it shows that there are two paths to getting to the same result of becoming a legendary band, like obviously to different s scales, economy of scales with these two bands, but like Lords of the New Church are looked back upon as being an incredibly important band, an iconic band. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I when I look back at IRS records, I mean, the bands that most stick with me are the ones like that, you know, that, that were really running wild. And the other, the other that do that, that kind of work with me are things like Pat McDonald with Tim Buck three mm -hmm. were lyrically, the guy was just brilliant. You know, mm -hmm. he was always anti-business, you know, which pissed me off because <laughs> he turned down so much money. But the other guy that was really brilliant was, was, uh, William Orbit, you know, who later became a super producer, you know, did Madonna's Ray of Light album, you know? Yeah. And I, I signed him when he was a nobody, you know, and, and I gave him his first producing job, you know? So I, I, I looked back on a lot of those bands and said, well, you know, you look at William Orbit and he's so different from Steve Bader's, you know, from the Buzzcocks from, you know, so there was a wide variety of bands that were there, you know? And again, it was sort of me saying, well, I'm not going to be stuck with some rule. I have to sign bands that are exactly this. I'll sign what I goddamn well like. That was my view, you know. So whether it be a Wasmona Rees or, a, you know, Buzzcocks or the Stranglers or whatever, you know, the IRS Records did have this cross-section of different kind of bands. And I, I thought that was the strength of the label, you know. Although later on, as we gained more and more people and, you know, we had rent to pay and bonuses to pay and all that. You do start signing things because you need to sell some records, you know, and that that's one of the tragedies of, of, of a new business, basically, is that you sometimes end up where you, you know, you were a, reb a rebel in the beginning, but you might end up back where you started, you know, basically signing stuff because, well, you need to put numbers on the table, you know, and I think that was probably the end of IRS when it finally got to the point where you know, I couldn't sign just what I liked. I had to sign some things that I thought might make sell some records, you know? Yeah. Well, I guess that's when, you know, you have the formation of that establishment and then that you have that next generation that comes along. Like you were saying punk was to the previous generation. You always have to have the next wave to kind of upset the wave before it. Like that's why it continues. Yeah. Well, one, once I was at the Roxy club and uh, for some reason I was standing next to, um, Joe Strummer from the clash. And I remember him saying to me, he says, well, you know, they, they were all about anti-establishment. And he said to me something that was very sort of a very important statement. And I always thought afterwards, you know, that guy is really smart. You know, he said, you know, one day we're going to be the establishment. It was a recognition that, okay, he's a rebel now, but one day, you know, he's going to be the establishment and people are going to rebel against him. You know, so he knew enough that, you know, that's basically the circle of life. You know, you challenge something and you end up being a revolutionary. And it's like, you know, <laughs> what happened to the Cuban revolution or you know, the Russian revolution or whatever, you know, it all starts out ideal, idealistic and it's all changed for the sake of change. And then you end up back where you started, you know, the, the uh, you know, I think the, the famous, you know, animal farm 
book is really about that. You know, it's, you know, where four legs, good, two legs, better. You, you eventually do it for survival. Like you're saying, there's bonuses to pay. There's rent due. Like, yeah. you know, you talk about it in the beginning, actually in the book, there's, there's, I forget which artist you're talking about, but just the idea that they didn't have any commitment or someone that works for the label, I think. And the, the fact that they didn't have any commitments, they could work cheap. And because of that, they were able to kind of build this whole thing and, and take chances that people that might've had kids might've been in relationships, might've had other things kind of holding them down, wouldn't be able to do because they had all these commitments, financial commitments that they were beholden to. And I think that ultimately impacts music on some level. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's called the golden, you know, the, the golden handcuffs, basically, mm. you know, you, you know, you're, 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 you've got, a wife and kids and mortgage and this and that. And, you know, can you take a risk to go to say, throw it all away and say, well, I'm going to go be a wild rock star. You know, yeah. it's fine when you're 20 or 18 years old, but when you're 40, forget it. You know, you got, you got other things to worry about. And I think that's, that's one of the, you know, the tragedies of, of, you know, a lot of, a lot of things that, that happen, you know, as, as time moves on and, people change, you know, and not always do you grow with, you know, I mean, there have been some of the people that have grown and have moved on to other things, whether it be Richard Branson or whatever, you know, but you know, a lot, a lot of businesses start, but then basically fail because they're no longer relevant for, to what times have changed basically. And they don't change with them. Yeah. I think that's why the real measure of success isn't necessarily you know, longevity of a company, more like cultural impact of a company, because something could be around for a, a, a six months, but change the world. You know, like we talked about sniffing glue fanzine that changed the world. Like that, that ushered in a whole zine revolution where once again, like, you know, not to beat up on these shoe companies, but shoe companies are still making zines to this day. You know, like the impact yeah, no, of sniffing I, glue I think is you're huge. Right. You know, I think you're right. I, I think that, you know, when I, when I was writing the book and I was thinking, you know, why am I writing this book? I did not want to write the book from the standpoint of these are the things I did and aren't I great and you should appreciate you know, all these achievements I had. I was, I was more interested in it being a lesson to say, look, you know, you can make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. And that's part of it, you know, that, you know, there got to be lessons out of all of this. What are the lessons that you can apply to any business, not just the music business? Because I did not want to be somebody that was, you know, basically pushing one narrow view of, you know, I was, I, I was, I was thinking, you know, if you starting a restaurant or starting a small business, could you learn something from this book? You know, that, that was really where I was coming from. And I think, you know, it's, it, it's important to know that you can start from a small beginning and lessons like, you know, make it inexpensive, gives you latitude, you know, um, I, if I, if I had gone to A&M records with the police and asked for a lot of money, they would have thrown me out. You know, if I had gone to Jerry Moss and started IRS records and said, I need your money to launch the label, he wanted to hear the music and he would have rejected the music, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, the fact that I actually built the business with very little money meant that I was, I had, I was more free later on. I wasn't so free when I had 50 people and mortgages and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You brought up A&M and one of the parts of the book I found really interesting was the stuff about the dead Kennedys and the trouble you ran into with IRS, which ultimately leads to faulty products USA starting with getting the dead Kennedys record out on A&M. But there is a test pressing I've seen before of that record uh, on A&M fresh fruit for rotting vegetables. So what did it get to the test pressing stage or were they just pressing all of your stuff? anyway well they were pressing all of my stuff but jerry moss called me into his office and it, it was it was one of the failings that i had i had promised jello biafra that we would put out his record because he deserved it you know uh, i would put out his record through the a m distribution system which was a mainstream distribution system and when jerry called me into his office and said look i can't have a band on the label with the name dead kennedys it's not the music it's the name because he was very close to the kennedy family mm. And, you know, it was Jerry Moss and I, I really, I couldn't bite the hand that feeds basically, you know? And so I basically had to say, okay, I won't do it. And then I took the record and, and we put it on faulty products. And I think that was something that Jello has been pissed off about and probably still pissed off about 
And he's right to be because I didn't live up to what I had promised, you know. Um, but I was committed to put the record out. I did put it out. Um, and, you know, it just uh, so happened that it, it ran afoul to, you know, with Jerry Moss. Uh, you know, but it also they, he stays with you and they do a bunch of records with you guys doing their distribution for a while afterwards. Right. I believe. Well, we did, a, we did a few things, but faulty products had its own problems because the problem with, of independent distribution was getting paid basically. Mm -hmm. So I began to run into the same problems, you know, where you would, you know, you'd have, you, you would have this, this moment. Well, do I pay my staff? Do I pay the rent? Or do I pay the royalties? Yeah. You know, and you know, you're sitting there with your staff and your rent and there's a guy knocking to the door saying, are you going to pay the rent or am I throwing you out of your office? So you think, well, I'll worry about the royalties later. Well, of course you do that a few times and pretty soon, you know, you realize that, you know, this is not so good for the reputation. So you decide, well, what I decided in the end is, well, I better just close faulty products because it was, it was just too big a battle fighting to try to get paid from the independent distribution, which doesn't exist any longer, you know? So a lot of those independent distributors went broke because a lot of the big labels, A&M included, realized that fighting for money was something that was not a, not a fun part of the game. Yeah, no, definitely. It's like the cash flow thing that kills a lot of the labels. Yeah. I mean, the cash flow killed faulty products, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, you put out the circle jerks wild in the streets record. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on like that LA hardcore stuff. Well, step four you know, came out we were, we were looking for anything that was, that had a, um, uh, something behind it, you know, um, and was genuine and real. And that included the stuff that was going on in LA included stuff that was going on in Chicago, New York, London, Manchester, you know? And so I wasn't particularly married to say, well, it's got to come from LA uh, or anywhere else. I mean, you know, I signed one group out of Tampa, Florida. I signed and you know, um, you know, REM came out of, you know, make, you know, Georgia, you know? Mm -hmm. So we were not married to any particular area of, of artists, but of course being in LA, you know, you know, my staff would come across the circle jerks or the other bands that were in LA, uh, more than they would, bands that were in the middle of America somewhere. The other thing that happened was that we, bands heard of the fact that we would listen to their music and we would get weird records coming from all over the world. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know I, I'd be stopped on the street by somebody speaking a strange language, you know, and he'd heard that, you know, we were signing weird groups, you know, so <laughs> I'd find some group from Czechoslovakia, you know, wanted to have their record put out, you know. So basically, you know, as Charlotte Caffey from the Go-Go said once, he said, IRF's records became the home of every disenfranchised, homeless person, degenerate, uh, <laughs> because we were the only place that would listen to their music. But that's amazing. You bring up the fact that it went international. Like, this went worldwide. Like, that's the thing I find that's so fascinating about punk. And, you know, it happens with metal and it happens with other types of music. But I think punk is really where you do have this sort of, like, international explosion like you know starting when you bring the sex whistles to amsterdam like that you have this thing that becomes this global movement where this idea that anyone can do it and you can do it yourself and virtuosity can come second to motivation and and sort of just energy like that is the thing that's amazing about this thing even more than any of the sonics because like you're saying it's it's not one sound yeah because and i think that the ethic that you know you can do it would apply to somebody living in France just as much as it would be somebody living in Chicago, you know? Yeah. So why not? You know? Um, and I think that that motivation did inspire people. I mean, I found punk groups in Lebanon. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's incredible how it spread. Like I, I'm, I'm, I'm love the idea that international punk rock and the fact that you have labels in Brazil putting out records by bands from Japan and that you have this sort of like free interchange of ideas that exist just, you know, as a network unto itself, you know, and it's, you start seeing it like with a college radio, you talk about Oedipus in the book and meeting Oedipus and how important that was for the police to kind of get radio play in Boston right out of the gate. And like you, you know, like in the book, once again, you say like when the doors close, you just got to open a window and find another way in when they won't let you into the house. And that's what, yeah. I mean, I, I always considered, you know, my job, my job was to find the door, open the door, but it was the artist that had to walk through. Mm-hmm. 
And the artists that walked through were the ones that succeeded. But there were some that, you know, didn't walk through the door, you know, who should have walked through the door, but didn't, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think I said somewhere in the book that there are, you know, two kinds of people, the ones that walk through and the ones that don't. But that, but actually, I, I think that there's three kinds because there's, there's some people that don't know that, don't know that there is a door, you know, um, and that, or that, you know, you, you have the, the glass half full people and the glass half empty people. And then there are people that aren't quite sure whether the glass is half full or half, half empty. And so they need somebody to tell them, you know, mm. and that was sort of my role. I'm, I, I considered myself a catalyst. I, I can, I didn't never consider myself an artist per se. I might influence a song or, you know, push a chord or something or, but basically the artist came up with the, the stuff and I was the catalyst that motivated them to get out and do it, you know, or created the platform for them to, to reach the, a wider audience. So my, my role was always the catalyst. Maybe these are the people that don't know there is a door, or maybe these are the people that have a, maybe it's a fourth type of person that's almost too big of a personality to fit in the house in the first place. But like, you know, someone like we talked about Lux Interior, even like a Jello Biafra, but like the one guy we haven't talked about is Marky Smith. And, you know, you worked with Marky Smith very early on, uh, someone that never really ever made it into the mainstream, but was someone that was always relevant in the conversation of music and alternative music. And I was just wondering, you know, Live of the Witch Trials is, probably my favorite LP, British LP of all time. I was just wondering what your memories are of working with him and, and The Fall. Well, The Fall was a band that, again, Mark Perry found, and, and we signed to, 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 to uh, Step Forward Records. And they stayed with Step Forward much longer than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And the thing about you know Mark Smith was that he, he was more about what was being said uh, than a lot of the other bands were. He had more um, political, social sort of savvy than the rest of the people. So he had more of a, um, well, he had something more to say, which is why he lasted longer. Where some of the bands, you know, Sham 69, 14, you know, they were, they were more of the moment. But Mark Smith had a long-term view of things. And he was somebody that was going to make music for a long time. And he did, you know. So my, my memories are not, I mean, I didn't spend a lot of time with him. But we realized that The Fall was certainly a band that was, they were important, you know. And that was part of what I liked. I, I really liked the fact that we were, we were doing things that people considered important. It was not just about making money. Because if it had been about making money, I mean, I think I would have stuck with just, you know, well, I would, uh, most of the bands I, I, I probably wouldn't have dealt with, you know, because yeah. the yeah. police were dismissed. Every, every band was dismissed, you know, as, as a no hoper, you know, even the bangles. Well, I was told to walk like an Egyptian was not a single, you know, desert Rose was not a single, <laughs> you know, the go, the go goes, yeah, well, you can't sign an all girl group, you know, the police, oh, you must be joking, you know. The biggest bands I ever worked with are the ones that everybody dismissed, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, wait a minute. If I get dismissed, then people say it's crap, must be good. Well, it kind of has to be like that, right? Like you're saying, the new generation is going to want something different and going to want something new. So, of course, the people that are in that establishment aren't going to get what the new generation is going to be uh, drawn to. Yeah, and I think a lot of them were, you know, the, the, the mainstream – they were already at the point where, you know, they had rent to pay and staff to pay and all that. So they needed, you know, records that they knew would sell. And they listened to this punk stuff and they go like, well, wait a minute, this is going to sell, you know, and they, they were applying old rules thinking, well, radio wasn't going to play this, you know, and it's, it's true. You know, the police were banned by BBC in England, you know, because Roxanne was about a prostitute. They banned Can't Stand Losing You because Stuart was standing on a block of ice with a rope around his neck. And, you know, they were against the single because the, the sleeve celebrated suicide, you know. So a lot of the bands just wouldn't get played, you know. And then it took somebody like a John Peel. You know, he, he was the first to play the Cortinas and Chelsea and the Police and a lot of these bands, you know. And we, you'd hear those records on the BBC. And his special show, just like Oedipus, was one of the 
was the first to play Roxanne in America, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and um, changed the game, basically, you know. So radio was always important. But the fact is that some of the radio that, you know, the, the mainstream was missing, like college radio, uh, were, were not considered particularly important at the time. You know, even MTV, when it started, was pretty much dismissed by the music business. And I, I jumped on them because they were ready to play my stuff because that nobody would give them material. So I said, well, if, if you'll play my material, I'll give it to you gladly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. And that led to some amazing stuff making it on the airwaves on MTV in the early days, and which led to a bunch of people being inspired to make music sort of for the next wave of bands. You know, like it's amazing how these ripples kind of spread. Yeah, my view was, you know, I don't care if MTV doesn't have much of an audience, but they have some audience, mm -hmm. and they're going to play my stuff. Great, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and the tr the truth is that it isn't the quantity that counts. It's really, you know, it's, it's like somebody once asked me, he said, well, what was the most important show you ever did? You know? And I think they would think that I would be, I would say, well, Shea stadium, 80,000 people, you know, with the police sold out in a matter of minutes or the us festival, to half a million people or, and I say, no, the most important show I ever did was to four people in Northern New York. When the police walk out on stage and they look out in that empty club, a dumpy club somewhere in northern New York, and they say, well, there's four people here to see this English group on their first tour of America that nobody's ever heard of. So let's give them a hell of a show. And they played a hell of a show. Mm -hmm. One of the four people was Oedipus, a DJ at a, who had a radio show, a punk radio show at MIT in Boston. He was so enamored with the group who then gave him the Roxanne single, which had come out in England. He goes back and he bangs that record on the radio and it becomes a regional hit that drew the attention of Jerry Moss, who then said, well, get the band. And that launched the police. So Oedipus was a big factor in the police succeeding. And it happened from a show with four people. So my, you know, one of the lessons of the book is it doesn't matter how many people you're playing to. It matters who's in the audience. Yeah. Could be one person you don't even know who could change your life. So when you walk out on stage, even if it's only a few people do your best because you never know. Well, it's like every show, like the police picnic, how many people have come on this podcast? Cause we're, I'm, in, I'm from Toronto that went to see the police picnic when the police picnic happened in Toronto that were inspired to make music off of that. That was one of their first shows, you know, like it's just amazing. Yeah, well, how every show is important like that. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's one of the, you know, the things. I mean, the police picnic was another example you know, that the, the, the promoters, they were little club promoters, and but yep. we stuck with them because they really tried, you know, and when they they came up with the police picnic idea, we, we, we said, sure, do it, you know, so they became major promoters because we decided to back, you know, we stuck with them. There were other promoters that, you know, didn't think big enough, basically, and they, you know, they wanted us to stay small and course the police were not going to stay small you know but we always stuck with people as, as long as we could because i remember sting saying to me one day says you know be nice to the people on your way up because you may need them on your way down well this has been very very nice to get to do this with you miles and anytime you want to come back and nerd out about punk rock please know the door is always open but before i let you go can i ask you one more question Sure. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about stiff records, not a lot, but stiff records comes up, but there's none about Chiswick. And I was just wondering if you had any sort of relationship with Chiswick records back in the day, because it seems like it would have been kind of like parallel worlds. Well, there were other labels that were, they were putting things out, you know, stiff records stuck with me because they were one of the first and they had the damned and they had, you know, they had some, some interesting acts, you know? Um, and you know, then, then you had, you know, the, the, the bands, the UB 40 and the specials and madness and those coming out, you know, on, um, but of, of, of the punk labels stiff stuck out because it was one of the, it was the first, one of the first basically Chis Chiswick. I, I didn't really, you know, I ran into, you know, there was rough trade records and there was all sorts of little punk labels. So everybody was having little labels, you know? Mm. So, you know, you run across these people, but you know, I, I didn't have any particular relationship with them that I could remember. Well, it's such an exciting time because it's all of you kind of getting out there and starting these labels that 
look, beggars is now beggars, obviously. Like you would go on and do IRS and change the scope of alternative music. And it just, it's amazing how it's all kind of the same little period in the same, you know, big city, but ultimately a small place that everyone's kind of popping off at the same time. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the things that happens is that, you know, you have a, uh, something, a, you know, a buzz happening and it, and it spins off in different directions and some succeed and some don't and some morph into something else. And some, you know, I mean, we, we morphed into the, the next stage basically was taking on America, which is really the big challenge. And I realized that, you know, England was, was fun and exciting and all that, but in the end, you really want to break America because that's going to influence everywhere, you know? So that I, I sort of focused on doing that, which is why I started IRS records. And cause I was also getting a lot of pressure from British acts to say, well, you know, what about America? Cause they also wanted to happen in America, you know? So there was a real pressure to, to, to get to America, which was really, and, and there were a lot of American bands who were just being dismissed, you know, at the same time as, you know, the British bands were. And, you know, so to start a record label in America where I knew well um, from the previous experience and I figured, well, if anybody's going to do it, it had to be me. And, you know, a and Records turned out to be a great partner. They gave me latitude. But the latitude, a lot of it was really me saying, look, I don't need your money. Just put the records out. If I had asked for a lot of money, I think Jerry Moss would have said, well, let me hear the records, you know, because actually I did once ask him for money when I wanted to sign the B 52s. Mm -hmm. And as I needed his money, he had a right to hear the music. Well, when he heard the B 52s, he decided that they were not up to his standard and he didn't give me the money and therefore I didn't sign them. But that's one of the, you know, mistakes I think we both made, you know, mm -hmm. I should have pushed him harder. And, you know, I should have made him listen harder, but basically, you know, cause I, I, I still love the B-52s, you know, it's just, a, you know, one of the great bands of the, the whole new wave, but we were right there at the beginning, but, you know, by the time I got ready to make the deal, they, they needed a bit of money. Well, ultimately they're the band that leads to REM, right? Like it's them to pylon and then to like Athens, Georgia. It, it's, it, it's amazing once again, how these you're still in these scenes like this scene is still producing bands a few years later that would ultimately produce rem like a huge band that you had yeah you know, you know i mean i irs with i you know with that or you know fine young cannibals and you know the go-go i mean we we had our run of hits a lot of the bands didn't last very long mm -hmm. i mean i think rem was the only band that actually fulfilled their contract <laughs> you know every every other group broke up on the second album the first album the third album I don't think anybody made it beyond th album three, except REM. But once again, we're not measuring success in financial terms, just on cultural impact. And those had massive impacts, those two records. Yeah, they did. <laughs> um, this has been incredible, Miles, and thank you so much. And once again, congratulations on the book. It is fantastic. Well, all right. Thank you very much. And if any time, if you forgot something you wanted to ask, you know how to get hold of me. Thank you, Miles, for coming on the show. And uh, hopefully, Miles will come back one day. And we got there's a lot of stuff I forgot to ask him about. There's a lot more, a lot more stories. There's an incredible story about X in the book. Anyway, pick up the book, read it in there. Uh, and that's it. All right, on to the next episode. Next episode on the show, we have we have a bona fide uh, a two world hero here. We I like to refer to the memos as like Bo Jackson, someone who's not only accomplished in the world of punk music but has also done something out else outside of that world as well and this guy kind of kind of sums up what i'm talking about coming up in a few short days steve caballero is here that's right the skateboarding legend the punk music legend from bands like the faction odd man out soda and urethane his brand new band as well this is a fun conversation. This guy, I, I think this guy is one of the most underrated punk rock resumes. We, we get into it on the show. And that's it for the show today. Oh, remember, as always, black lives matter. The lives of indigenous peoples matter. We need to protect trans kids. We need to help trans people protect themselves and stop hate and violence towards Asian people and people of different faiths and just knock all that shit out. Because that that's not 
those these aren't political issues. These are just basic human rights issues. You know, political issues. They're they're like, you know, bike lanes and and worthy causes. Don't get me wrong, but but that's political stuff. This is just basic human rights stuff. So just fuck fascism. We don't. No one needs that shit. No one. There's oodles, oodles of incredible punk songs written about why that stuff sucks. So, you know, fuck all that Nazi stuff. Fuck all that Nazi shit. Uh, remember to sign your organ donor cards because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't need that shit. You're just like, get that out of my body. I'm done with it. You know? Uh, it just, you know, it just can be something incredibly life-changing for someone. Do something creative for yourself. Create your own culture. Start a band, start a fanzine. Just do a drawing. You don't have to show anyone. It can help your mental health. But as Tony Erba says, you know, you got to make your own culture too. Anyone can do this stuff. You know, put yourself out there. You never know what can happen. You might start a record label. You might, might change the world through music. You know, who, who knows? Who knows? Try meditating because it can help. I, I didn't believe in it and I tried it and it's helped me. Maybe it'll help you. Who knows? And that's it. Hopefully I'll see you soon. Stay safe. And uh, see you on the next episode. I'll talk to you on the next episode. I won't see you, but I'll, I'll talk to you then. <laughs>